Before we get started, I wanted to share the caveat that this story does deal with themes of suicide and depression, so I just wanted to give everyone a heads up about that before you listen. Thanks. Anna Shoots by Dean Peterson Chapter 1 The bullet bounced against my shin in the elastic of my sock. The 5.56 millimeter had become my closest friend, a jagged little pill better than Lexapro or Prozac. It would be the prescription that needed no refill, the cure-all that would fix eternity for me as soon as I could get my hands on something to shoot it out of. I had never seen real horror movie fog until I got to Germany, a thick gossamer mist that hung low over the soccer fields and little patches of woods. She ran her slimy wet fingertips around your neck and inside your clothes, raking icy digits down your ribs and chest. The vapor was too thick to see more than a few yards ahead of you. The water droplets made slow parting curtains as I ran forward, and then they just as quickly dropped back into a solid shroud behind me. My side still bit at me where I had been sewn up. A mean tooth line of black stitching like railroad tracks on my abdomen had healed well enough for me to run. The side effect was that my battalion had deployed without me. You need an appendix to kill bad guys, the peppy new blonde lieutenant had told me. So you'll be on rear D till we get back in the summer. Now my Adidas is flicked over the asphalt of the old Luftwaffe Kaserne. I could still feel an uncomfortable sensation where the scar was, and I hoped I could run until it burst, split open and bleed out on the asphalt in the fog. I tried to kill myself by running before, but unfortunately all it did was made me a better runner, and further ensured my place in the army I had come to hate. Someone who didn't feel as careless and brooding as I did might have thought better than jogging on a night when the fog was thick enough to swallow all sight and sound. A beautiful ghostly veil, dense enough to hide a running body in the mist so well it might make it too late when the headlights of a passing car caught and slid on the dew-slick pavement. You could only hope. I looked around in the cloak of steam like water, and though I felt cocooned and well hidden in the darkness, I took a knee and feigned tying my shoe. I worried that the bullet might bounce out of the elastic and into the gloom, and then where would I be? I stuck a thumb inside my sock cuff and rolled out the heavy little cylinder into my palm. I had gotten lucky that they hadn't searched my room while I was in the hospital during the appendectomy. They loved to search rooms randomly on the detachment of misfits and medical holdovers known as Rear D. The little brass pill had been lying there in my dresser while I had been drugged and comatose in the hospital. Having ammo off the range could get you nailed in the army. Ironically, for an organization known for killing people, a club that loved its members to carry rifles and machine guns and grenade launchers, it was really picky about giving you anything to shoot out of them. A few weeks ago, I was prone in the pebbly gravel of the range waiting for the little green men to rise from the earth. Short man silhouette targets made of green plastic were about to pop up for us to shoot at, and all I thought about was putting the muzzle of my rifle in the sweet horseshoe of flesh under my jaw and pulling the trigger. Unfortunately, there was an NCO right next to me. One stood next to each of us as a lane safety. What if I choked, if I brought the barrel up to my head but I couldn't pull the trigger? Then I'd be tackled by the lane safety and referred to all kinds of pointless evaluations and counseling so that the army could cover itself. I would need time to hold the muscle there, to let its oily stiffness rest against the flesh between my jawbones and become less alien and awkward. I wanted to wait until it lost its menacing sense of threat and became a warm and inviting friend cradled in my arms. I would eventually grow calm and relax and then slide down into a numb nothingness, curling into the fetal position with only an afterthought of an opposable thumb sticking out to catch the trigger as I went to sleep forever. I was haunted by something brooding and defeating all my life, a black veil that would drape itself over my eyes since I was a teenager, a stinking dark tattered shawl some old hag silently wrapped over my shoulders with arthritic fingers as I slept. It came with the changing of the seasons, or an unfortunate event, or sometimes with no prompting at all. Weeks, sometimes months would pass until I was finally released and could breathe again and see things for what they really were. I was tired of feeling it, though, and tired of fighting it. When the call had come over the range loudspeaker to switch our weapons from safe to semi and engage targets of opportunity, I started shooting down range as fast as I could, not caring if I hit anything, hoping that squeezing the trigger too quickly and erratically might cause the weapon to jam and give me a window to do what seemed like my best plan. I shot through 20 rounds without a hitch. When that failed to fail, I inserted a 10-round magazine for the next phase of qualification, fired two rounds, and then slapped up on my magazine, pretending to correct a malfunction. You jammed? called the NCO standing over me. 
I nodded the lie, not wanting extra eyes on what I was about to do. I pulled back the charging handle, tilting my rifle as if clearing a jam, and heard the thin, tinny clink of brass being ejected into the gravel. Go! shouted the NCO, thinking I had cleared the jam. I resumed firing, viciously engaging the remaining targets, feeling a soothing, dark sense of satisfaction coming over me. After I sent the last of my ammo downrange, I lay in the dirt, grinning with the popping of rifles all around me as the rest of the rear D misfits expended their rounds. I snaked out a low arm along the ground towards the glint of brass shining in the rocks. I pushed it against the dirt, shoving it down between my wrist and my cuff until I felt it lodge between my sleeve and arm. Then I was happy. When they frisked us as we left the range that day, I had already shoved my souvenir down into my boot, which they never checked. I don't know why. That night, I reclined in sheer contentment, watching the lamplight bounce off the little amber pellet. I held it delicately between thumb and pointer finger. It was a narcotic, a magic button, an escape hatch, a little 4.1 grain key to unlock the door from my misery. Sergeant Andrews had berated me that morning for missing my targets after I shot all that ammo aimlessly downrange. Soon I won't miss, I'd said under my breath. My scare with the appendectomy had told me I needed to hide my little friend somewhere, a place where I could retrieve it before the next gunnery range, but if found by somebody else, it wouldn't be connected to me. The shock of the slick asphalt jolted up my shins and joints as I kicked over the seams in the concrete near the airstrip. I wore all black when I ran, as if maybe I could just melt into the darkness and disappear from this place. Running had been one of the few things that spiked my veins and made me feel any good. However, lately, like most everything else, I'd lost interest in it as well. We ran all the time in the army, but never alone. We ran in platoon formations and company formations and battalion formations that crimped your stride. On top of that, some idiot had to be shouting a cadence the whole way, which you were supposed to shout back at him. Failure to do so meant you weren't motivated. Most of the fat sergeants who said this didn't know anything about running. Truth is, if you wanted to run fast, you should stop yelling and save your air for breathing. The army would never run for fun. It would never do it on a wet, foggy night to be alone with its thoughts. The air swirling down my windpipe with my labored breathing brought back a faraway memory. Something about running on dirt roads that cut through newly hayed grass, watching a windmill spin in an endless marathon, a dark mass of storm clouds like the sails of ships spreading out on the big sky, dropping their black tentacles to earth. Early on, thoughts like that had made me ache inside to go back home. Now, though... They seemed too far away and too distant, too much like thoughts enjoyed by somebody I used to be, but could never become again. Sometimes when I sped over the slick ground in the night, I'd feel the overwhelming swell of something good just beyond the horizon, but not anymore. Tonight I had my only hope in my sock, Alice's little cupcake that would say, eat me, and make all reality just too small for me anymore. I began to scan for a familiar gap in the lonely woods nearby. It was the same ground I had scanned when we marched through the forests and weeds during sergeant's time training. We were supposed to scan for IEDs or signs of IEDs placed by the sergeants to simulate a combat environment. Somewhere just ahead of me in the woods would be the ant trail, a telltale inorganic line of slightly raised dirt running across the road. It was supposed to be indicative of some sort of poorly placed wire or cable designed to detonate an IED. The NCOs never planted a new one, nor did they remove the old one, so after a while, we all remembered where the fake IED was and reacted to it perfectly. We'd halt, call it in, and provide security according to our training with surprising precision for a bunch of misfits. Tonight, though, I was scanning for an objective that I cared much more about. I saw something materializing out of the fog ahead of me. I cursed a little between labored breaths. The one night, I didn't want anyone seeing me disappearing off the road to do my secret stuff in the woods. The figure was running through the dark, headed in the same direction as me, and only a little slower. I ran under the shoulder a little bit to make room as I gained on it. Just speed up, I thought. Don't make eye contact, and hurry off into the fog. I was nervous, though, feeling the bullet wrapped in my fist. The air was freezing as I came even with the figure. It was not some corpulent NCO trying to make weight before being kicked out of the army, or some balding old lieutenant colonel reliving the glory years out in the dark. I could tell by the way the person moved as I closed in through that vapory darkness that it was a woman, maybe in her twenties. She had long, thin white legs that kicked nimbly and quickly over the stony gravel. In the dark, I could see her feet were bare. I was taken aback, having heard of barefoot runners but had never seen one outside of runners' magazines. She wore what looked like a short, white bathrobe, 
and though I had every intention of ignoring the looming figure, I couldn't help but try to look her in the eye as I came even with her. Her curly brown hair was unrestrained and bouncing with the movement of her body like a jiggling explosion. She didn't turn to look at me. I moved a little further away to our left. As she was intentionally avoiding me, I wanted to give her space. Then she shot a quick look over her shoulder at something behind her. I saw her face for an instant. Her alabaster skin shone like kitchen tile. Long nose and forehead glistening with mist or sweat or both. She had full lips and a small round mole below her left eye. Her eyes were big and overflowing with tears. The corners of her mouth were drawn down into a grimace of fear. You okay? I called over the noise of my breathing. Her head snapped forward and she sped up into the fog, paying me no mind. I shot a glance over my shoulder, peering beady-eyed into the fog for whatever she was running from. I felt my hackles rise, wondering if whatever had made her that frightened would come after me. I listened for the sound of a barking dog, the clicking of claws on the pavement, but it was dead quiet. I turned back towards where the runner had disappeared and picked up the pace. I saw the dull blur of headlights in the distance. It was the military police, the MPs. They were doing another late-night patrol of the woods, which they always did for lack of any real crime to fight. I'd seen them out there plenty of nights. I hesitated for a moment, still peering into the dark, wondering if it was a good idea to fool with them, then ran towards the lights and flagged them down. I felt very self-conscious because of the illicit projectile in my curled fingers. The MP in the driver's seat of the cruiser was a girl, and surprisingly pretty for an army girl, or even for a normal one. She rolled down her window with that whirring electric sound. She wore a mosquito wing on her chest, the emblem of a new private. She looked youngish and still had some acne on her forehead above her eyes. Hello? She seemed a little bemused. I saw a girl running that way, I said, between breaths, pointing down the road behind the cruiser. She studied me curiously. Realizing I wasn't making a lot of sense, I tried again. She was barefoot and looked like she was running from somebody. The MP nodded. What was she wearing? The sergeant in the passenger seat asked. It looked like a bathrobe, I shrugged. He nodded. She was running towards your car. I'm surprised you didn't see her. White girl, he asked. Real white, I emphasized. I almost said, like, alabaster white, but I stopped myself from using a word most army people wouldn't understand. Like a toilet tank, I elaborated. She say anything, the sergeant asked, which shook my head. All right, bud. We got it, he said, reaching for his radio mic in the console. He pointed forward with his chin, and the pretty MP began to drive away. Hey, sir, I heard him say into his mic, She's back. The red of the MP's car taillights faded into the misty distance, and I watched them disappear. They have a lot of bathrobe women running around here, I wondered as I resumed my run. Her face kept flashing through my mind, and I kept shooting glances over my own shoulder. The cold of the night was starting to get to me. Most of the assorted German and Russian girls who hung around the outskirts of the post could usually be seen on Saturday and Sunday mornings, forming a queue outside the back gate waiting for a taxi home. I had heard rumors about a Russian girl who'd signed on to post one Friday night with a soldier, but who never left. Instead, she made her way from barracks room to barracks room, sleeping with whoever occupied them, in exchange for a place to stay, and booze or beer or food from the dining facility. A lot of the guys laughed about it and hoped she'd come to them, but the thought of it made me sad. The higher-ups briefed all the barrack soldiers about a Hungarian, Romanian, Russian, unauthorized person, etc., living in the barracks, and told us to report her to the MPs or a chain of command if she was sighted and warned of the consequences of harboring her. Was that her? The girl I'd seen in the woods? Had she run out of living space in the barracks and run off? Why was she running? The MPs didn't seem to be chasing her. I ran off the road and deeper into the woods after finding the familiar gap I had been looking for in the weeds on the side of the road. I knelt at the base of a tree where I hacked a series of hash marks into the bark with the sharp tip of my bullet. I made the marks low against the soil where only I'd notice. I pulled out an empty cigar tube from my other sock and slid the bullet in, hearing it hit bottom with a satisfying heavy clink. I wondered briefly how long the case would protect it from condensation and water and whatever else was in the dirt. You better hurry up and use it then, I said sarcastically under my breath as I pushed it into the soft ground at the base of the tree. I tried to sleep that night. Like most things, I'd given up on girls too. Just the same, I kept thinking about the one I'd seen that night, the barefoot one, not the MP. When it made someone so poor and desperate and sad to be running shoeless through the woods, sleeping with nasty soldiers for stolen apples and oatmeal cookies. So many of the girls the guys dragged from bar to barracks to bed in a never-ending cycle were bedraggled-looking creatures who looked like they could navigate the halls of the soldiers' quarters with their eyes closed. 
The girl in the robe didn't look like that, though. I couldn't say why. She didn't have dead eyes or a scheming expression. I rolled onto my back, still missing the metallic soft dinging against my fingertips of my bullet that was now out in the woods, the sharp point of its tip under my soft palate, a cold little sleeping pill all wrapped up in the warmth of my comforter as I tried to sleep. So that's the end of chapter one. I hope you enjoyed it. I appreciate your listening. I am looking for a sponsor. If anybody's interested, please contact me through the email, and I'll have chapter two for you next week. Thanks. Have a good week.